Columbia Disaster, STS-107, January 16, 2003. The Space Shuttle Columbia lifts off from Kennedy Space Center, carrying seven astronauts on a 16-day research mission. Commander Rick Husband, Pilot William McCool, Mission Specialists Kalpana Chala, David Brown, Laurel Clark, Michael Anderson, and Payload Specialist Elon Ramon, Israel's first astronaut. For NASA, STS-107 is a routine scientific mission, but the danger appears just 81 seconds after launch. High-speed cameras capture a 1.67-pound chunk of foam breaking off the external tank's bipod ramp and smashing into Columbia's left wing at nearly 1,600 miles per hour. It's larger than any foam strike seen before. Engineers immediately recognize the risk. A hole in the wing's reinforced carbon panels would be catastrophic during re-entry. The debris assessment team asks for military satellite imagery to inspect the damage, but shuttle program managers deny the request. Their reasoning? Even if the wing is damaged, Columbia cannot reach the ISS and cannot be repaired in orbit. This decision locks in the fate of the crew. The foam strike has already punched a 6 to 10 inch hole directly into the wing's thermal protection system, and no one on board knows. For 16 days, the crew performs over 80 experiments, working around the clock inside the research module. Their video logs show smiles, jokes, and routine updates. No warnings, no alarms. Mission Control speaks to them as if everything is normal, because they believe it is. February 1st, 2003. Columbia fires its engines and begins re-entry over the Pacific, descending at 17,000 miles per hour. For the first several minutes, everything looks normal. Then, as the shuttle hits thicker atmosphere, superheated plasma finds the hole in the wing. Temperatures inside the wing spike past 2,500 degrees Fahrenheit, melting aluminum structural components in seconds. Columbia, still holding together, streaks over California, then Nevada, then New Mexico. 8.59 a.m. over Texas at 207,000 feet. The wing structure finally collapses. Columbia yaws violently. Aerodynamic forces rip the orbiter apart. Debris spreads across Texas and Louisiana, visible from the ground as multiple burning streaks in the sky. The crew compartment is destroyed instantly. All seven astronauts die within moments. The mission ends 16 minutes before scheduled landing. The investigation exposes not just a hardware failure, but a systemic failure in NASA's decision-making culture. Major reforms follow. Mandatory thermal protection inspections for every shuttle mission. On-orbit repair capabilities for damaged tiles and panels a new risk assessment process giving engineers authority to escalate concerns. Vladimir Komarov, Soyuz 1. April 22, 1967. Vladimir Komarov walked through the halls of Baikonur Cosmodrome, knowing he was likely walking to his certain death. Komarov was 40 years old and one of the nation's most experienced cosmonauts. He had flown in space before, commanded Voskhod 1, and was trusted by the Soviet space program for its most politically important missions. Now, he had been selected to pilot Soyuz 1, the first crewed test flight of the Soviet Union's new spacecraft, a vehicle intended to surpass the United States Apollo program and restore Soviet dominance in the space race. For weeks, engineers had documented more than 200 serious faults inside Soyuz 1. Reports went up the chain, but none of them stopped the launch. The mission date had been locked for political reasons. The Communist Party wanted the flight to coincide with Lenin's birthday and the upcoming May Day parade celebrations, turning it into a propaganda victory. Komarov also understood a personal consequence. If he refused the flight, his backup, Yuri Gagarin, the first human in space and a national hero, would be ordered to fly instead. Gagarin had already tried to intervene and warn officials, but nothing changed. Komarov chose to fly to prevent Gagarin from being forced into a spacecraft everyone knew was unsafe. At 3.35 a.m. on April 23rd, Soyuz 1 lifted off into the pre-dawn sky. The failures started almost immediately, 
one of the two solar panels did not deploy, cutting electrical power in half. Without full power, Soyuz 1 could not orient itself toward the sun, causing the batteries to drain rapidly. The ion sensors responsible for attitude control began giving false readings, sending the spacecraft into uncontrolled tumbles. Komarov used manual thruster firings to stabilize the craft, consuming valuable fuel. On the ground, controllers canceled the planned launch of Soyuz 2, a second spacecraft intended to rendezvous with him to avoid putting more cosmonauts at risk. Komarov continued orbiting in a vehicle losing reliability with every passing hour. After 18 increasingly unstable orbits, Mission Control instructed Komarov to attempt an emergency re-entry on April 24th. He manually oriented Soyuz 1 for descent, compensating for failed sensors and uneven power. Re-entry heating was normal. The capsule survived the plasma phase. For a moment, a safe landing seemed possible, but the failures waiting below were the ones engineers had most feared. At an altitude of about 23,000 feet, the main parachute container failed to open because of a design flaw documented months earlier. The parachute stayed jammed inside the housing. Komarov deployed the reserve chute. It immediately became tangled with the partially deployed drogue and the jammed main chute. The spacecraft had no functional deceleration system. Soviet listening posts recorded Komarov's final transmissions as he fell at more than 250 miles per hour, condemning the officials who forced the mission forward despite all engineering warnings. At 7.24 a.m., Soyuz-1 impacted the ground near Orenburg. The descent module collapsed into a flattened disk and the remaining fuel ignited. Recovery crews spent hours separating Komarov's remains from the fused wreckage. His death triggered an 18-month halt to Soviet crewed missions. Engineers completely redesigned the parachute system and finally addressed the hundreds of flaws that political pressure had ignored. X-15, Flight 36597, Michael J. Adams, November 15, 1967. U.S. Air Force Major Michael J. Adams climbed into the cockpit of X-15 at Edwards Air Force Base. Adams was 37 years old, a skilled test pilot, and this was his seventh flight in the experimental rocket aircraft. The X-15 program was designed to explore the boundary between atmospheric flight and space. Adams' mission was straightforward, reach 250,000 feet and test onboard systems. At 10.30 a.m., the X-15 was released from a B-52 bomber at 45,000 feet. Adams ignited the rocket engine, producing 57,000 pounds of thrust. The aircraft accelerated past 3,800 miles per hour and climbed to 266,000 feet, officially entering space. At that altitude, something went wrong. The attitude control system malfunctioned, introducing a slow yaw motion. Because the atmosphere was extremely thin, Adams received no physical feedback that the aircraft was drifting off course. As the X-15 descended back into denser air, the yaw worsened. The aircraft entered a spin. Adams attempted to correct using conventional flight controls, but they were ineffective at that speed and angle. Ground controllers tracked the erratic flight path as communications became intermittent. The X-15 was now flying sideways at over 3,000 miles per hour. At 65,000 feet, traveling at Mach 3.5, the aircraft encountered extreme aerodynamic forces. The G-loads exceeded 15 Gs, beyond both human tolerance and the aircraft's structural limits. The X-15 broke apart in mid-air. Adams likely lost consciousness almost instantly. The wreckage impacted near Johannesburg, California, leaving a large crater. Michael Adams' body was found still strapped in to his ejection seat. The investigation concluded that a flight control system failure at high altitude initiated the yaw motion that Adams could not detect or correct. Michael J. Adams was posthumously awarded astronaut wings, becoming the first person to receive them after dying in space. Hope you guys are liking the videos. Subscribe, leave a like, and watch the next video in the playlist.